Welcome, everybody. You just entered into the winning zone. Winning zone. Winning zone. Today, I will be taught the word of God. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I am ready to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever living seed of the Word of God. I will never be the same in Jesus' name. Amen. You just entered into the winning zone. Winning zone. Winning zone.
says that, that our Father sits down and inhabits the praises of his people. When you have the audacity to trust him in the midst of whatever is going on, he gets his attention. He's like, wait a minute, somebody's pulling on me. They believe me. They trust me. They know I'm their God. I'm compelled.
Welcome Church Online. Thank you for joining us again today. We're excited as always to bring to you a powerful, powerful word. Thank you for being with us. Stay tuned and I know you'll be blessed. Be in God's presence to live in his presence. He's intentional. Amen. We're going to start in uh, Isaiah 54 today. I want to talk about peace today. The covenant of peace. Do you know we're in a covenant of peace? Well, if you don't know, you will know. Amen. We have a covenant of peace, and we're going to look into what peace actually is. Isaiah 54. 53 is a great uh, redemptive chapter talking about Jesus on the cross. And see, we get into chapter 54, which talks about what we have after the cross. And one of the things is a popular verse in Isaiah 54. It says that no weapon formed against us shall prosper. Isn't that good? Every tongue that rises up against us in judgment will condemn. This is our inheritance. This is our heritage as servants of the Lord. And God says, I love this, that their righteousness is of me. So, so the righteousness is from God. And in Isaiah 54, this is also in Isaiah 54, and a lot of people miss this, but there's a lot in these two verses here. Verse 9, it says, For this is like the waters of Noah to me. Now hold up. Now I'm going to share something really powerful with you. Um, what happened in the waters of Noah? Well, God destroyed the earth with a flood, except for Noah and his family. And then God put a sign in the sky which was the rainbow. Amen? And it's still with us today. And if you go to Genesis chapter 9, um, and I encourage you, you can uh, pull, up, pull up the Summit app. You can go to our app, and you can find uh, some scriptures there, uh, and uh, you can follow along or just follow along up on the screen. Praise the Lord. But... Um, 
you see that God said he would put a sign in the sky after that flood that he would never destroy the earth again with a flood and that the rainbow would be a sign. And it also says that God puts that rainbow there as a sign to remind him of his covenant that he made and that he would never destroy the earth again with a flood. Now, it's also a reminder of something else. Because he says this is like the waters of Noah to me in this, in this new covenant. For as I have sworn that the waters of Noah would no longer cover the earth, so, I, so have I sworn that I would not be angry with you. Now, this is not Pastor Al talking. This is God talking. He will never be angry with you again in this, in this covenant. And see, a lot of people, they get confused um, because they don't understand the difference in covenants. We're in a new covenant. And what a lot of people try to do is they mix the old with the new. And they reference Old Testament scriptures when, in terms of God's judgment and God being angry. God's not judging America. God's not judging Africa. God's not judging Haiti. God's not judging France. God, see, all the judgment was taken by Jesus on the cross. And see, you have to always, even though we go to the Old Testament, I'm in the Old Testament now. I'm a new covenant, but I'm a new covenant preacher. I'm not an old covenant preacher. It is a, the, preaching the Old Testament, the Old Covenant law, is called a ministry of death. And let me tell you something. Any message that doesn't bring you peace is not the gospel. I don't care what, I don't care what any, how many scriptures people use. People can use scripture, but it's not the gospel. Because in time past, God spoke through the prophets, Hebrews tells us in these last days, he speaks to us through his son. So when you're reading the Bible, you always must interpret it through the finished work of Jesus. When uh, Peter, James, and John got all excited when uh, Moses and Elijah appeared with Jesus, they said, um, let us build, you know, three tabernacles. One for you, Jesus, one for Moses, one for Elijah. See, a lot of people miss this. There came a voice from heaven, and you know what God said? This, this was referring to Jesus. And if you understand this, some, some of y'all from the old school will understand. God said, I ain't studying Mo Moses and Elijah. This is my beloved son. Hear him. Hear him. The law came through Moses. See, Moses represented the law. Elijah represented the prophets. God said, hear him. <laughs> the law came through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. God swore See, God will never be angry with you, not even when you sin. I'm going to take a sip of tea on that. See, preaching sin and preaching uh, about trying to get people to stop sinning is, uh, is, is not the gospel. It is the goodness of God that leads people to repentance. When you see the, the, the strength of sin is the law. When you preach uh, do good, get good, do bad, get bad. When you preach the law, it actually stirs up people's passions. It's sinful passions. See, I'm against sin. But see how we accomplishment, accomplishment, accomplish it 
is not by telling people, you stop sinning, stop sinning, stop sinning. We get so sin conscious when we should be righteousness conscious. And God swore that as, as I have sworn, say, say as I have sworn, this is God talking, that the waters of Noah would no longer cover the earth. Now, even though this is the Old Testament, he's talking about, this is right after Isaiah 53, he's talking about new covenant. Because of the finished work of Jesus, he was punished for our sins. That's the reason why God is not punishing you or anybody for their sins, because Jesus was already punished for our sins. On the cross, he took our sins, past, present, and future. Well, how in the world he took our future sin? I thought he just took our sins that, that we committed before we got saved. All your sins were future 2,000 years ago. <coughs> now, does that make me want to go out sinning? No. When you understand you've forgiven much, you love much. And we don't need to preach the hell out of people. What we need to do is give people good news. And see, what, what happens is people don't trust the gospel's ability to change people. But the gospel will change you. As the waters of Noah, God swore. Who swore? God. He said, as I have sworn that the waters of Noah would no longer cover the earth, so have I sworn that I would not be angry with you, nor rebuke you. Amen? Next verse. For the mountains shall depart, and the hills be removed, but my kindness... Say, my kindness shall not depart from you. Y'all can stop talking now. <laughs> Nor my covenant of peace. Hold up, y'all. If, you, if, 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 if you're curious about this, if you're like, oh, I don't know if that sounds right. I don't know about that. Look at, if you want to know who is, the, who is the greatest representation of the Father? Jesus. When did he go around condemning anybody? Only, you know the only people he was hard on? Were them religious folks. Self-righteous. Proud. Right? Those are the people. They all that. And they try to elevate themselves. Right? These Pharisees and Sadducees, these religious folks. See, religious folks, they always think they're right. Not teachable. They, 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 they don't want to learn anything. They, they already know it all. So what can you tell me? After all, you know, God spoke to me. Well, if it don't line up with the word, I'm not receiving it. Right? See, so, God says, my kindness will not depart from you. If you want to know what the Father's like, look at Jesus. He said, I didn't come into the world to condemn nobody. I came that the world might be saved. And the people that they thought that he should be correcting and rebuking, he showed love and compassion to them. Jesus said, if you see me, you've seen the Father. So, my covenant of peace is a covenant of peace. Now, peace doesn't mean <clears throat> tranquility. I mean, it, it does mean that, but it's more than that. I was uh, this morning just looking out in and, uh, and my basement, just looking out into the lake. It seemed real, real peaceful and quiet, okay? But that's not what peace means. Because the world can have that. See, God's peace, you can be peaceful in the midst of a storm. See, anybody can be peaceful. You can seem like you have peace when everything's just, who is so much peace in the house? And nobody here, the kids are gone, and it just seems so peaceful, see. Um, 
But what, is, what does the Bible say peace is? In the, in the Hebrew, this is shalom. It means completeness, soundness, welfare, safety, health, prosperity. And I like this one. Nothing missing, nothing broke. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Because, see, how can you not have peace when you have the peaceful one on the inside? The one that created the heavens and the earth living on the inside of you. See, in the Old Covenant, again, difference between the Old Covenant, New Covenant. Old Covenant is a ministry of, we're going to get into righteousness in a minute. Because, see, when we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God. And we have our own relationship with God. In the Old Testament, it was a ministry of condemnation, ministry of death. In the New Covenant, it's a, it's a ministry of righteousness. Thank you, Lord. And in this New Covenant, not every man will teach his neighbor and every man, his brother, know the Lord. He said, all will know me. You have your own relationship with God. I don't stand between you and God. As your pastor, I don't stand between you and God. I, I don't have God's word for you. I mean, I'm teaching you the word. I have my place. I'm a ministry gift. But nobody is a go-between between you and God. You have your own personal relationship with the Father. God speaks to you directly. Amen. It's a wonderful thing. To have a relationship with your heavenly Father. Peace, completeness, soundness, welfare, safety, health, prosperity, nothing missing and nothing broken. This is what we have with God. We have peace. Thank you, Lord. And see, so you can have that in the midst of a storm. Now, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And see, when we are justified or declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God. So your righteousness, by, not by your performance, not by your self-effort, but righteousness is a gift. The first Adam blew it. And I, I, I like how the scripture puts this. Jesus is the, the first, or, or Adam, obviously, was the first Adam. Jesus is referred to as the last Adam. Not the second, but the last, because there ain't going to be no more. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Now let's look at Romans 5. I'm talking about this covenant of peace. See, when you have a covenant with somebody, you end up, like if, if two people enter into covenant. See, the Bible is, is basically an Eastern book. They under, understood covenant. And when you enter in a, a covenant with somebody, you and the person you enter a covenant with become one. And see, we're one with Almighty God. Almighty God is our Father. Now, we're going to, two, I got two words highlighted, one man and then one man's. So this is the first one man's talking about the first Adam. The second one man's talking about the last Adam. There's a difference. Now, I want to skip ahead while we got this scripture up. I don't have this scripture down, but the, you know, in the very next verse, is very key. Um, where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. So what he's doing here, he's contrasting the first Adam from the last Adam. Now you know what the first Adam did. First, what the first Adam did it got us into a mess, which is the reason why Jesus, the last Adam, had to come and fix what he did. But how many of you know where sin abound, what Adam did through his fall, 
through his sin in the garden, which everybody born after him inherited his sinful nature. Grace, through the last Adam, much more abounded. So how many, of you, how many of you can see that what Jesus did was much more powerful than what Adam did? And I'm, I'm sharing this is because there's some people think that when they, when they sin, they just, you know, they run away from God. And that's not what you should do. You should run up into his lap and know that he's not angry with you. Even when you sin, because he rebuked, he, he promised, he swore that he would never be angry with you. Not even when you sin. And what that does is, um, and some people, well, you can't, you can't be telling people that because they just go on just keep on sinning. I mean, that's one. There's always a few. But they don't really understand the grace of God. When you understand the grace of God, it just makes you, you know, for every one person who want to go out and sin when they, when, they, when they understand that God is not angry with them when they, when they sin, he said, they'll never be angry with you. Your sin does not disqualify you from the blessings of God because you didn't qualify yourself. The Bible says giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to partake of the inheritance. He qualified you. It's not because of your right doing. It's because of Jesus' obedience. It's by his obedience on the cross that, that you're righteous. And see, for every one person that want to run out and sin when they, uh, when, when they find out that, that all their sins have been forgiven, there's 99 people who, when they sin, they don't want to sin. And they feel bad. And because of religious teaching, they feel like that God is mad with them, so they hide from God. When instead they should come boldly to his throne. To obtain grace and, and, and mercy, grace to help in time of need. Can you see that? What Jesus, the last Adam, did was more powerful than what the first Adam did. Now watch this. For as one man's disobedience. Now remember that next verse. I didn't go to it, but you, got, you have your Bible. Where sin abounded, grace much more abounded. By one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. Now hold up. Now. Most people know in the body of Christ that when you were a sinner, there was nothing you could do to get rid of condemnation. See, how many sins does it take when you're a sinner? When, let's, let's go back in B.C. days. How many sins did it take for you to become a sinner? None. You were born that way. We inherited Adam's sin nature. So that's how powerful what Adam did was. We were made sinners. You weren't, you weren't a sinner because of what you did. Now, most of the body of Christ, under, they, oh, yeah, I get that. I get, I get, I get that, Pastor. See, because you could do some good things as a sinner, but you're still a sinner. Nothing could change your sinner status, even though you did some good things, right? Because that's how powerful what Adam did. But what God is contrasting here, where grace abounded, or where sin abounded, grace much more abounded. Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. So, there was nothing you could do to change the status of a sinner. That's why we needed Jesus. Right? You could do some righteous acts. You could try to live holy, but see, your nature was the nature of a sinner, and nothing you could do could undo that. You had condemnation. You, you, you couldn't get rid of it. Now watch this. Now he's contrasting the first Adam and the last Adam. So also, this is what much more abounds. By one man's obedience... Not your obedience. Not your obedience made you righteous. Righteousness is a gift. By Jesus' obedience, many were made righteous. So, 
So here's my question for you. Why do people think that you can do some bad things as a righteous person and it changes your righteous status? Why do people think you can become unrighteous by something you do? They get that nothing you could do could get rid of your condemnation as a sinner. Why do you think you can do something to get rid of your righteousness? What that saying is, is what Adam did was more powerful than what Jesus did. But the Bible says that grace much more abounds. See, you can do some bad things as a believer, but it never changes your status with God. If it could, then what Adam did was more powerful than what Jesus did. Now, now see, the only thing that clouds that, I heard a scientist try to explain to somebody that the world was round. Seems crazy, but a lot of people going around, oh, you know, the world is flat. Some people got this revelation that the world is flat now. Whatever. So the scientist, he was very articulate, and he was trying to explain to them. He said, yeah, they're, they're wrong about it. He said, but, he said, the issue is they don't have enough information to know that they're wrong. <laughs> and some people, they, 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 they go around with some information, and they have enough scripture to make them dangerous. But the issue is they don't have enough information to know why they're wrong. I guarantee you they ain't seen this. And what people try to do is they try to reference this by, okay, I don't believe that, so let me try to figure out why this is wrong. No, you try to, let, let's just let the scripture talk to you. It's all right to think in church. He's trying to tell you, he's really not focusing on, on, on Adam's disobedience. He's focused on Jesus' obedience. It's what Jesus did that made you who you are. Oh, man. So there's no sin that can get rid of your righteousness. Thank you, Jesus. See, we, we know that under the first Adam, don't we? We, we, we know and man, no matter what you do, you know, like you, you know, man, we know that. And we preach it. Man, look, look, man, I'm, I do some good things, man. I give to the Red Cross. I give to the United Way. Man, I do some nice things. I'm a nice person. I was like, no. <laughs> right? I mean, right? You, you, I mean, you could be the nicest person, but you got, you, 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 you're a sinner not because of those things, because of what you do and don't do. Because of the, what Adam did. So if you say that there's something we can do to get rid of our righteousness, you're saying that what, what Adam did was more powerful than what Jesus did. So what makes you think that as a child of God, there's something you can do to get rid of your righteousness? On the other side of that, if the one thing is true, the other thing got to be true and much more. If I had the mic, I'd drop it. But, 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 but I mean, but that's it. Man, the word of God is so plain. You know, you know and, and, and I'm, I'm telling you what, I, I say this is powerful stuff. This last, this last Adam credited you with a foolproof righteousness. Can't nothing break this. You're sealed with the Holy Spirit. Can't no, nothing break that seal. And don't act like you don't sin. We all do. And when we do, we know that God's not angry with us. Thank you, Jesus, that, that his love for us never changes. And so we can say, Lord, just, I, I just thank you. Lord, I missed it. I know it. But I just thank you that you still love me. And I can just stop, drop, and roll. I can go on by my business. Right? Romans 10, 15. See, this gospel, see, if, if, if a message doesn't bring you peace, it's not the gospel. The gospel is good news. 
it's the, it's the almost too good to be true news of God's unmerited favor. It's, it's not favor. Grace is not favor. It's unmerited favor. Favor you don't work for. So you don't work to receive the blessings of God and the promises of God. How shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, there's people that, that they, they went, but they ain't sent. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of what? Peace. What's peace, man? Completeness. Soundness, welfare, safety, health, prosperity, nothing missing, nothing broken. Say, I have nothing missing and nothing broken. See, peace is not the absence of adversity. It's peace in the midst of trouble. Peace in the midst of the storm. See my feet here? Anybody? Y'all see my feet? They're beautiful. Because I'm preaching peace to you. Ugly feet preach condemnation. <laughs> Somebody, if you feel condemnation when you hear a message, look at their feet. <laughs> I can guarantee you they got some ugly shoes on. <laughs> Amen. Even if their shoes look good, if you take them off, they got some corns. And... <laughs> okay, so who bring glad tidings of what? Good things. See, it's the goodness of God that leads you to repent. So all you got to do is look at Jesus. Tell me who he condemned. The Bible says the common people heard him gladly. You know why he didn't condemn folk? Because that wasn't his message. What he was, who he was hard on again were those people they were messing with him because he preached a message of acceptance and love. Unconditional love. Man, don't even know that woman. You go, he's a sinner. You're like, duh. <laughs> those that are well don't need a physician, but those that are sick. And those are the people that heard him gladly and came to him. See, bring glad tidings of good things. It's a gospel of peace. It says also in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 15. It's one of the, the weapons in our, our armor, right? Having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Back in those days, the armor, they had these kind of these shoes that lock them in to the ground where they can be in a position of, of, of stability when they were under attack. And that's what the gospel of peace it do you, it just it chills you right out. It, you, it, 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 you, you, you just like, you, you stable. It's a gospel of peace. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Uh, we looked at Romans 5, one, I, I, re- I referenced that. Um, having been justified by faith, we have peace. We have peace. We're not trying to get it, we have it. And uh, even when they, they, somebody come and cuss you out at work, you can have peace right in the middle of that. And what you got to do is you just got you, you to draw on it. Because it don't feel very peaceful. Your flesh is going to want to cuss them out back. So you got to, I mean, because sometimes, man, these situations that come, they just will come up on you. Anybody have somebody just like roll up on you and just with some mess and just some... You know, they, they fussing at you about something. Huh? Whoa. Just understand, man. I mean, in those situations, that's why you can't, wait, well, let me, go, let me where go get my Bible. You got to be ready, man. When you have that armor on, you, you, you ready at all times. Because what's in you going to come out. When you squeeze the sponge... Right? What's in that sponge coming out? See? Isaiah 26, 3 says, you will keep him in. Now, I love this. Perfect peace. Who? thank you, Jesus. Who 
whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. See, when you trust God, you are at peace. Remember those boys, those disciples, I love this. See, this is not, the, uh, peace doesn't mean the absence of trouble. Mark chapter 4, this is not in your notes, but um, Jesus in the midst of the storm. In verse 35 in Mark chapter 4, on the same day when evening had come, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. Now, if you read this story, you know that they got into some trouble. But see, just think about it. Think about who's in the boat with you. That's bad. Like, who in the boat with you? Think about who's, my English teacher that. Well, think about who's in the boat with you. When you got the one that created the heavens and the earth, and he says, go to the other side, what can stand in your way? He said, let's go to the other side. Jesus went to sleep. Hallelujah. See, Jesus was God, but he was also a man. And you know he's still a man? He's still God. He's still a man. The Bible says that there, people miss this. There's one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. I love that. Even he seated, even though as he's seated at the right hand of the Father, as, as God, he's also the man Christ Jesus. Why is that? So, because he can represent us. Really, the covenant that we're talking about, this covenant of peace, it's not really between God and us, it's between God and Jesus. And we were the sleeping partner. See, God fixed it the way you can't mess it up. This covenant that we have is really an extension of the Abrahamic covenant. And when God created that covenant with, with Abraham, it was like a covenant and a covenant. It means the cut until blood flows and they split those animals. And it was God and Jesus walking between those pieces while Abraham, who Jesus represented, was asleep. So he couldn't mess it up. He tried. <laughs> he got what the Bible calls in the flesh. See, what the Bible calls in the flesh is not what people like getting up and hollering while I'm preaching. That's not what the flesh means. The flesh means self-effort, trying to do stuff in your own self-effort. That's what he, he did with him and uh, Sarah, when it was Sarah's idea, it was always the woman gets these guys in trouble. And she, I'm just kidding, come on. Y'all woke up on that one, didn't you? So uh, she, she uh, convinced them to sleep with their maid. They had an Ishmael. But because the covenant was between God and Jesus, he couldn't even mess it up. He tried, but see, that wasn't God's plan for him. But then after, you know, he, he got almost 100 years old. And, and, hey, that was pretty good. He had Ishmael about 83. That's pretty good. I mean, he's producing at 83. I mean, I ain't, you know, okay. But he waited. God waited till he was through with his self-effort, trying to do things himself. He's about 100 years old, and God's like, you through? Viagra couldn't help him, 100 bottles of Viagra and Cialis, that couldn't help him. <laughs> and then God brought Isaac for supernatural. Your self-effort can make some stuff happen, but it's natural. God is a God of supernatural. And the Bible says, as Isaac was, we are the children of promise. We are the children of the supernatural. We don't, see, don't try to make things happen through your self-effort. Understanding, understand that your blessings are a finished work. Jesus said, let's go to the other side. He wants to sleep. So uh, now when they had left the multitude, they took him 
Along in the boat as he was, the other little boats were also with him, and a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. I mean, it's a pretty bad, bad storm, right? I mean, it's filling the boat. But Jesus is asleep. He was in the stern, asleep on a pillow, and they woke him and said to him, Now, wait a minute. If the master, the one who created the heavens and earth, said, Go to the other side, I mean, what's going to stop him? So what did he do? Well, they, they said, they woke him and said, teacher, don't you care we're perishing? He, he arose, rebuked the wind, and said to the sea, peace. He wasn't in trouble. The prince of peace spoke peace. Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But he said to them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? Think about this. So, you know, I'm with you. I'm the one that spoke the worlds into existence. And I'm in the boat with these like, why are you so fearful? Thank you, Jesus. We have a covenant of peace. And it says again in Isaiah, my covenant of peace, he said, nor shall my covenant of peace be removed. He swore that he, oh, let me tell you this. When he swore that he'll never be angry with you and he's got that rainbow in the sky, that's not just to remind him that he'll never destroy the earth again with a pl- flood. He said, this is like the waters of Noah to me. So the rain- rainbow also reminds God that he'll never be angry with us again. That's what I, that's what, that's what I see when I see that a rainbow in the sky. Every once in a while, a beautiful rainbow show up in the back of our house and reminds me, oh, thank you, Jesus. God will never be angry with us again. And you know, according to Revelation 4.3, there's a rainbow that surrounds the throne. Thank you, Jesus. That rainbow around the throne, it reminds God that he'll never be angry with you. So when somebody trying to come and take your peace away from you and somebody trying to come and get up in your face and they fuss and hollering at you and things like that, it's just like, wait a minute. I have peace. He keeps me in perfect peace. See, as long as your mind stayed on him, you just think about, think about Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Is Jesus afraid of this situation I'm facing? Jesus has got it all under control. So, hey, I trust him. Go on, go on back to sleep. Thank you, Jesus. We have a covenant of peace. It can't be broken, folks. We have peace. And we have peace with God. Say, God is not angry with me. Some folk can't even say that. Say, the Father loves me. See, it don't have anything to do with your obedience. The obedience that the new covenant talks about is the obedience of faith. And when you walk in the grace of God, grace will teach you to live godly. And see, some people don't trust the grace of God. They don't trust Jesus to teach people. They feel they, like they, they got to try to correct people. But no, we don't need police and Barney Fives in the body of Christ. Right. Difference between old covenant ministry and new covenant ministry, totally different thing. See? And so I want y'all to be educated. I want you to be educated in the Word of God so nobody can move you off your peace. 
we have a covenant of peace. We have peace with Almighty God. Amen. Every head, body, every eye closed. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you for peace. Thank you, Lord. Not, not, not as the world gives. Hold up, bring that scripture back up. I know everybody's starting to scramble around here, get tapes, stop everything. That's okay still. We're going, I, I, um, I left, this, left this scripture out. I want to give it to you. This is so powerful because, see, it's up to you not to let your heart be troubled. Jesus said, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives. Say, not as the world gives. Do I give you? Let not your heart be troubled. See, that's up to you. Trust Jesus. And see, and you, don't, you don't let your heart be troubled. See, those disciples in that boat, they should have said, look, Jesus is in here with us. He said, go to the other side. We're going to the other side. See? All they had to do was go over there and look at Jesus and him being asleep, and they know everything's under control. When you look at Jesus in the midst of your situation, you know you're coming out on top. Look at the ampli- what the Amplified says. Peace I leave with you. My own peace I now give. This is this covenant of peace. I bequeath to you. That's a covenant term. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled, neither. I don't care what's going on. I don't care what you're facing. Don't let your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Stop allowing yourselves to be agitated and disturbed, and do not even permit yourselves to be fearful and intimidated and cowardly and unsettled. Now, I know those storms can talk, and those winds can holler, and the waves can start coming and filling your boat. See, it's not an absence of trouble that we're talking about here. It's not that you're never going to have trouble. You're going to have trouble. But see, Jesus said, be of good cheer. In this world, you'll have tribulation. You'll have trouble. He said, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Jesus is with you. He's in you. You have your own relationship with God. Thank you, Jesus. I got a message I want to teach about, man, uh, just how easy faith is. You see, see, because instead of trying to focus on having faith in your faith, have faith in his faith. Does Jesus, when you face with that seem like insurmountable circumstance, don't focus on, let me see if I got enough faith to really... No, ask yourself, does Jesus, do I believe that Jesus has, have faith to get through this? Can Jesus handle this, in other words? And if you say, oh, oh, yeah, I believe you can handle this, then rest. Because it's easy to believe that he has faith to get you through. Remember, he told those blind men, Do you believe that you have enough faith? No. He said, do you believe that I am able to do this? Oh, shucks. Do you believe in your situation right now? Do you believe that Jesus is able? See, that's that's different than me trying to work up my faith. It ain't about my faith. It's about trusting his faith. I live by the faith of the Son of God. And ain't nothing he can't get through. So I rest in that. To be continued. I know you were blessed by the word. Thank you for all that you do for and with us here at Summit Church. As we move forward in our experience, we would love for you to participate 
during our tithes and offerings. If you choose to do so, please follow the prompting on the screen. And please know, whatever you choose to give, we are so grateful and we thank you. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for supporting us. And we look forward to seeing you next time.